Hi, this is Cosmine of the Scorpions. You're listening to Monsters, Madness, and Magic right now. And hey, what can I say? There's no one like you. Klaus, take us back in time. You're a youngster, just a little kid. Are you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker? Are you all the above? I was reading books, but I was also a troublemaker, I think. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of trouble? <laughs> Always some good trouble, you know, <laughs> having a good time with friends, singing like crazy in the house, even in the early days, you know, I had, had some cool friends. Whenever they came to our house, I joined them and we were singing together and they they were brothers and man, the way they sang their beautiful harmony vocals, you know, so it was pretty cool and very inspiring in the in the early days. So just had a lot of parties going on, huh? Yeah, a lot of parties. Of course, I guess it was a couple of years later when I was hanging with all those musician friends from my first band, The Mushrooms. You know, so we were like pretty much on the road every other weekend with a lot of friends. I mean, in those days, we we had no no transport for the equipment. We didn't have anything, you know, but we had, we had a very strong, not fan base, but a base of friends, you know, right, and right. They, they came by with their cars. And so we went to some little clubs outside in the countryside, you know, and, and played a couple of shows for the weekend, you know, and that was it. And we had, had a great time. It was it was all about music, it was all about friendship and uh to impress the girls, of course. <laughs> so you mentioned that you uh, read books, Klaus. What do you have any favorite authors, or maybe some favorite books that you lean towards? Oh, not. I'm talking about the very early days mm -hmm. when I was into, you know, comics like Tarzan. You know, you know Tarzan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The man rocking the jungle. <laughs> yeah, the Tarzan, Jane. I know all of them. <laughs> exactly. That was the kind of stuff, you know, at early age that got me really inspired. Or oh, other heroes coming out of this comic, uh, comic world, you know. So, did you always live in Germany? Was is it, did you grow up and live there? Yeah, I grew up in Germany, Hanover, West Germany, at the time, post-war generation. Growing up, our parents were busy building up the country again, which was totally bombed after World War II, you know, totally destroyed. My father was a gardener, you know, he used to work in the famous Herrenhäuser Garden here, here in Hannover. So that's why we, we shared a house with, with another family in one of those historical gardens here in Hannover. And uh, <clears throat> it was pretty cool. Because for me, growing up there, it was like a huge playground, you know. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. So, with all those, all those beautiful nature around, you know, it was easy for my fantasy to become Tatsan. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd mentioned your dad was a gardener. Were either were either your parents were they musically inclined at all? Do you think that's where you got it from? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my grandma used to sing, and she had a beautiful voice. And my father <clears throat> used to play a man mandolin. A mm -hmm. mandolin. Uh, his brother played the guitar, or later his his friend had a guitar, and uh, the son of his friend played an accordion. You know, so and for the weekends there was always music in the house, and they were playing uh, those popular schlagers at the time you know mm. to cheer them up and 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 i think my father wrote a couple of songs himself you know i could never figure out what the inspiration was for that one you know but it <laughs> it was uh it was a very positive vibe in the house and for us for for the kids <clears throat> a couple of friends came along <clears throat> in my age group so we were playing a little percussion or things you know so it was always music in the house. It was beautiful and very inspiring. Klaus, when you think back to maybe formative films that you grew up on, what comes to mind? Does anything pop out? Oh, well, you're t talking about in the early days? Yeah, as, as early as you can remember. Do you remember the first film that you saw or the first time you went to the movies? 
Yeah, I remember that. Uh, I don't know the English title, Die Brücke am Quai. It was, I think it it was a war movie. And for some reason, I was hooked on the whistle theme. You know, there was a beautiful piece of music. I think that got me attracted. And I wanted to see this movie pretty much because of the music, you know. And uh, they wouldn't let me in because it was, I might have been 10, 11 years old. And this was allowed uh, when you had to be at least 12 years old, you know. So, mm. And I remember that I, I was destroyed you know <laughs> i was totally up in tears when i couldn't enter the movie theater and this was one of the early uh when i was around nine or ten years old and i wanted to see this movie so badly i guess because of the music you know because it, it was definitely not a not a, a movie for for a kid you know to go for a sunday afternoon cinema session you know so but this is what, what comes to my mind, you know. Right, and, right, right. Uh, it was because of the music. So, Klaus, this is a question I like to ask everyone because you you talk to all these people from different walks of life. You never know. Um, when you were a kid, what scared you? Oh, well, I think to be in the darkness, you know, to be in the dark in your room when you had big thunderstorms coming through, you know, I, don't, I thought that was scary and spooky. <laughs> Since we lived in this this house in the middle of a beautiful, huge garden, which w was a state property, you know, it, it was not that uh, I come from a working class family, you know, so this was part of the historical Herrenhäuser Garten here in Hanover. Uh, and so we were pretty, pretty much uh, on our own there. And uh, I grew up there until I was eight years old, I think. And then we moved to some other place. But like I said before, this place was, to me, so beautiful to grow up, you know, in, in the middle of nature and so much to discover. And it, it was a beautiful time. Then when we moved to a different area in the city, it was probably, it was a much nicer uh, apartment and for my parents and me, I was the only child to live in, you know, but uh, where I, I grew up in the, the first eight years of my life, it, it was so different. It was more adventure, you know. Yeah. You mentioned those <clears throat> uh, those parties you had with your friends earlier, Klaus. How early would you say that you discovered your own voice? Or was it your voice first or were you playing an instrument or anything like that? Uh, like I said, my father played the mandolin, and one Sunday afternoon, uh, he gave me the guitar that belonged to his brother, which was in some place in the apartment. And when I I hold it for the first time in my hand, my father showed me the first chords on, on the guitar, and he was playing like being the lead guitarist in the band, you know. He played yeah. the melody on, on the mandolin. And I just slamming the, some rhythm, you know, and he learned me the, he taught me the first chords on the guitar. And this is when I started uh, also to, to discover my voice and to sing when we had these kind of family gatherings around Christmas time, you know. So uh, there was a song called Ave Maria. I just jumped up on, on, a, on a chair. And this was my little stage, and I, I sang to the family, you know. And there was some very positive feedback. So I knew early on, I knew I I want to be a singer. I was not thinking about being a guitar player, <laughs> but it was cool. At least you can can play the guitar and, and sing along, you know. But my focus was on, on my voice early on because there was a reaction I got from from the family, these uh, family uh, parties, you know? Yeah. And uh, I had a very clean voice and getting a little older, when I met with the buddies with my first band, The Mushrooms, I worked hard on my voice to sound more rough, to give my voice more an edgy kind of sound, uh, like Len McCartney singing Twist and Shout or something like that, you know? 
outside of those parties that you just mentioned for your family, what uh, what would you consider your first time on stage to be? Did it go off without any problems? <clears throat> it was when, when I joined the little band called The Mushrooms. And, uh, like, they had some pretty cool guitars, some Fox amplifiers, you know, <clears throat> and we had a chance to play at the weekend some little place i think it belonged to the church nearby where like the kids came for the weekend to have a little party going on and we played there and uh, i remember that we like i said before we had no no car for the equipment we, we had a little something to carry on our equipment and we had we had to walk over there from the house we were rehearsing to this little church in the basement and this was, I remember it was the first gig we played and we played many cover versions like Beatles, Stones. <clears throat> also, I think, yeah, the guitar player, he was very good playing those those early Shadows songs. You know this British band, The Shadows? Yeah, I've heard of Shadows. Yeah. And they, they were very popular at the time. This is like around the mid 60s. They were pretty popular. And so we had a section in our show where I picked up my guitar and became second guitar player, you know, because it was to present the, the Shadows material, which gave me a break from singing, which was pretty cool, you know. So I I enjoyed very much to step aside from the front spot, being the lead singer in a band, you know. So I like this. And just to play guitar and uh, watch the crowd, you know, and uh, it, was, it was great. But this was just part of the show. But we played a lot of cover versions and uh, the band became quite popular around Hanover, all those little clubs uh, yeah. where we played over the weekend, you know. But um, this just was to figure out, is this the right place to be, you know? <laughs> right. So the feedback we we got was pretty good you know and uh was inspiring but a couple of years later um so we, we we split up you know and it was just uh when i met rudolf Schenker, who just had started the scorpions around the same time in the mid 60s that's where we met and played the same kind of gigs in and out of hanover klaus i speak with a lot of actors and musicians that's both two professions that could deal with Stage fright. Uh, have you ever has that ever been an issue for you? And if it was, how did you get over it? I think to this day, you always got uh, butterflies in your stomach. You know, before you go on stage, I think that's quite a natural reaction of your body. But the the moment you start the show, the moment you hear the music, you see the crowd, uh, it's gone. You know, so I never really had a problem with that. You know, because I felt pretty much at home when I went walked out on stage uh, for the show. It was always a very positive experience. But before, it can be brutal. You know, before you go out, it's it can be sometimes really tough. You know, but I think that most of entertainers, musicians, uh, singers go through this kind of thing. It's just part of the, the game, you know, and uh, there's a lot of tension in the air, but it's, it's all gone the minute you walk out on stage. Right. I think nerves are natural and it, it kind of helps you prepare if you're a bit nervous. Yeah, it's a good thing in the end, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So Klaus, at what age or at what point did you realize that you could turn your interest in music into a career? Uh, when I was in my early 20s, you know, so... I spent some time at the army and when I came back, I met Rudolf again, who just was taking care of his little brother, Michael, Michael Schenker. And uh, he hooked me up with Michael and I had, actually I had to go to their father to ask him that Michael can, can play lead guitar in a band together with me, you know, and Rudolf arranged everything. So, and, 
so their father was like, okay, hands up. Since I was a few years older than Michael, you know, it seemed like I came from the army. Uh, what can go wrong, you know? Okay. <laughs> so let him go. And so we had a band called Copernicus and we we still played also like covers from Led Zeppelin or Remember the Taste, a band with their wonderful guitarist and singer, uh, Rory Gallagher, you know. And uh, so we played some stuff from them. And we rehearsed like next uh, to the room where the Scorpions uh, used to rehearse. So Rudolf, he could hear how his little brother was doing next door. And since the Scorpions had no singer at the time, it came the point where the lead guitarist in the Scorpions left the band. And so Rudolf asked his brother Michael to join the Scorpions. And since there was no singer, uh, it was not... It was. It would be a good idea if Klaus joins us as well. You know? <laughs> and this was the beginning, really, of uh, a long run that still goes on every other day. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and we have a laugh about it. You know, <laughs> it's like, hey, but that's life. And we were very lucky, you know, that we met at the late sixties, where where it was just about passion for the music and uh, to be part of a, of a scene, you know, and uh, to to become a musician. Mm. And then when, when Michael and me joined the Scorpions, that was pretty much at the same time, the early 70s, when we started uh, writing our own, own songs. And uh, that was quite a challenge, but it came all very naturally and turned out that Michael was a super talented young guitar talent, you know, and also his compositions were really good, you know, and uh, so it was a challenge, you know, to to form a band in those days and to stay together to when you think there was no management, really, we had to do everything ourselves. We really had to be uh, rock believers. We <laughs> really had to believe there is a, a way for us to go. Being a German band, singing in English, you know, yeah. we always, from the early days on, uh, we didn't want to limit it ourselves by singing or trying to to work with German lyrics. You know, we we for us the sound, the English uh, language in in music was just perfect. You know. And even though our English was not very good at the time, you know, but the desire to sing in English was huge and turned out in the end of the day, it was a ticket for a world career, you know. Right. Now, would you say in those early years in Germany, was it rare for German bands to even attempt to sing in English in those days? Yeah. I mean, all the bands, like when we just were talking about the 60s, all those bands uh, played cover versions of their heroes, of their favorite artists, you know, and uh, it was like Led Zeppelin, The Who, you know, all those bands, The Stones, The Beatles. And uh, so this English language was so much connected with this music we thought was so mega cool. And we laughed so much, you know, there was no other way than to sing in English, you know, and uh, even we we were not very good uh, at, at speaking the language, uh, but no no problem. Right. <laughs> even if it sounded phonetically like what we wanted to say, we, we went for it, you know. There were uh, very few artists who started writing German lyrics. Basically, it was one artist who became very big in Germany uh, because he started in the early 70s writing German lyrics, but still staying on the cool side. He became very popular, Udo Lindberg, and he mm. is an artist. Uh, he's to this day, he's out there playing stadiums and uh, pretty cool. But he, he was like, he was the only one who did it. And later on, and like 
like now it's i think most of the german artists they sing in german mm, mm. so it's a whole different world now so different from what it was back in the 60s you know it's a re cultural revolution you know all those bands from america i mean the beatles were inspired by elvis and little richard you know the stones were chuck berry muddy waters all those great artists and then this wave came over germany you know in the in the late or no in the in the early 60s like 63 64 the beatles played at the star club in hamburg you know and we were like so to speak the next generation who picked up the guitars and uh were so so very much inspired by by most of those british artists that played here in germany you know so klaus in 72 you guys had that split so how did you eventually get back together we played together for quite a while with scorpions we recorded our first album with the scorpions lonesome crow but after that uh we had a tour in germany with uh the british band ufo mm. and they lost their guitar player because of customs passport reasons you know and they hired michael right away to so he played with us being the opening band and then he played with the main act with ufo yeah <laughs> and he was like it was so cool and they realized how good this german kid was and hired him right away so that's how we lost our first brilliant guitar player <laughs> and, and we started all over again uh, with Uli John Roth and uh, Michael actually had recommended Uli and uh, Uli who also became one of those guitar legends. You got lucky you again. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so we were very lucky and we went into the studio around 73, 74 for Flight of the Rainbow, which was the second album. And uh, it was a whole new band together with Uli, Francis, and the drummers changed, you know, almost every other month. <laughs> <laughs> As they you know, do. <laughs> so we were in trouble. Uh, but uh, so this Scorpions formation became really strong when we met uh, with our longtime producer, Dieter Dirks, in 75. We recorded uh, we recorded uh, in trance, yeah, Virgin Killer, Taken by Force, and we had an offer to play in Japan around 77, 78. That's when Uli John Roth decided to leave and because he wanted to do his own project and play his very Jimi Hendrix-inspired kind of music. And so Rudolf and me became the main songwriters in the band and with Matthias Jobs joining us in 78, 79, um, we became very strong, uh, powerful band, you know, that that spoke musically with, with one just one voice, you know, together. Before it was Uli writing his songs and Uda for me wrote our uh stuff you know and in the, in the end we had to split up you know but uh in the end it, it was a good thing because with matthias and the band we became more more of a unit we became very strong and after japan it was america was calling and uh, we had a chance to go to new york to be signed with one of the best management companies in the world at the time, Liver Krebs. And then 79, we played for the very first time in the United States. A dream come true. So Klaus, if you had to pinpoint a moment early on in your career where you think to yourself, holy shit, we've made it. Where Where's that moment? I, there were different moments. I mean, maybe the first one was in 75 when we played the famous Marquis Club in London, you know, and maybe the second was when we played in Tokyo in, in 78. Uh, I mean, for a German band to, to play in Japan, mm. in those days, nobody ever did that before, you know. It, it was culture shock, you know, and it was <laughs> such a wonderful moment. And then 
to come to America when we played at the big festival in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and that was also like a, a magic moment, you know. So there were always, we were going to the next level, you know, yeah. so to speak. And maybe the next one was in 84 when we headlined Madison Square Garden. There was only one way it was up. <laughs> so there were different moments uh, where you, but there was never uh, really a moment where you thought, now we made it, you know. Maybe <clears throat> when we played the Garden in New York, some magic moment where we thought, okay, now we're on top of the world. What comes next? But I forgot to say that we played the US Festival in 82, 83 in California in front of, I don't know, 250,000 crazy US fans and co headlining with Van Halen. You know, so yeah, that was a magic moment as well. I think that was the moment that made the Scorpions big in the United States. And when it comes to your, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, culture shock with the Japan uh, shows. How was that first U.S. tour for you guys? Do you remember that being a culture shock? Yeah, totally. I mean, we we were really lucky that after the first show we did in Cleveland, that we were part of a tour uh, all over the states. Uh, we were the opening act. Special guest was ACDC, and the headliner was Ted Nugent. You know, and Jeez. so mm. that package was amazing. And I mean, those crazy Germans, us, <laughs> we played like crazy every night. We had to to be in this competition, you know, which was like, it was different, a lot different from just playing in Germany or in Europe. But all of a sudden in America, it was like now we're, we're, we're playing formula one yeah. you know we're, we're not in some race car competition this is formula one and we learned a lot from america you know being the band being uh entertainers you know talking to the audience between songs and really giving every night so much energy and getting so much back from the u.s fans which I mean, the American fans and also the radio stations, the rock stations in, in the United States, they welcomed us with open arms, you know, and it was so much fun, even though we still couldn't speak the language properly, you know. <laughs> it doesn't <But> matter. <laughs> it was so much, so much fun to be on any radio station in the US, and they gave us a lot of support. And at the same time, we wrote some killer songs you know, that made it big in the United States, like No One Like You, or around 84, uh, it was uh, Love It First Thing, or Rocky Like a Hurricane, you know, so there were, there were certain moments, so it was so inspiring to, to see the United States for the first time through the tour bus window, you know, mm. spent all those nights on the road, you know, driving thousands of miles all over the United States and playing killer shows every night and to really to grow together and be inspired and come home with so many ideas and so many new songs that we recorded then while back in Germany together with our producer Dieter Dirks and then out on the road again. Uh, I mean, we just closed the studio door and we had to go someplace uh, on the other side of the planet, you know. So <laughs> it was like those days were crazy and amazing, but there was really rock and roll. And it was what, what, what every band like in the early 70s uh, or late 70s, this was like 79 going into the 80s, were dreaming of, you know, there was really like the big rock and roll dream come true, you know, and it was right. up to you if you fuck it up or <laughs> if you, if you stay alive, if you, even with all those parties going on, you know, if you 
can deliver the goods even after Hannah shows, you know. Right. That's pretty cool. So speaking of that, Klaus, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the recording of the Blackout album, did you, uh, you lost your voice for that recording, did you not? Yeah. Yeah, that was like, life seemed to be too good to be true, you know. And then tragedy hit me like with a big hammer on the head. And I lost my voice during those recording sessions and uh, for Blackout. And we had to stop. I mean, the band kept going in, in the studio, but I I had to go from one doctor to the, to another to check my vocal cords. And all they had to say, most of them was, what what you do for a living? And I said, I'm a rock singer. Oh, geez. You should look for a new job, you know? Oh, no. It was a big shock, you know? So, but... I found a very good doctor after I had surgery twice on my vocal cords. I found a very good doctor in Vienna, in Austria, who was taking care of all the opera singers. He gave me a very good treatment to build up my voice again and after surgery and also to give me mentally, you gave me the strength to believe in myself and and along the way, I lost it, and I said to Rudolf, guys, I don't want you to wait any longer for your lead singer. You should look for an, a new guy. You know, this is it for me. And Rudolf, being the guy that he is, you know, he said, no way. You know, we wait for you. You do whatever you have to do. He kicked my butt, you know, <laughs> and said, this is no, there's no easy way out now for you. You have to work twice as hard, do what you have to do. You guys will be back and we, we wait. We wait as long as it takes. And that was a very strong moment of friendship, you know, in all this, what was tragedy for me was a very powerful moment of friendship uh, that glued the band even more together than before, you know, and uh, I worked very hard and I came back. I survived the recording sessions for Blackout and I even survived the tour after that and uh, where we went all over the world and Blackout was a mega success. It was huge, you know, and uh, and I was the most luckiest guy on earth. <laughs> Did you ever get any... Uh... Did you ever get any reason as to why it happened? Was it just wear and tear from all the shows you were doing? I was just not really being too sensitive about my my voice. Mm. You know, I, I I just been was singing every show like it was the last one. You know, and I just paid the price for it, pushing so hard, and also working in the studio so hard. I I did always pretty much up to this day, all the backing vocals, you know, all those high high vocals on top of the lead vocal. There was no singer in the no second singer in the band. So I had to do them all myself. You know, and there was sometimes there was was a tough challenge, you know, and but especially the, the live shows and we played six, seven shows or more in in a row, you know, not giving your voice a rest. Uh, and too many things that went wrong and that I, I had to pay the price, you know, and I learned a lot in those days around 82 and uh, I learned about how to treat my my instrument a little more sensitive and to stay on top of things, you know. And, yeah, so it's in a way up till now I'm on the longest encore in my life, you know, because my <laughs> career was over. Right, <laughs> I was right. done. It, it really started after that, that the band became really big, especially in America. Right. So, Klaus, is it true that during that session, did Don Dockin fill in for you until you recovered? Yes. Don was a friend of Dieter Dirks, I think, at the time. And Don had a very nice voice, and he recorded 
uh, a lot of the back of the, the, the lead vocals when I was in the hospital and when I was not ready to sing. So the, the band wanted to move on. They wanted to work the, the songs and they, they needed someone to put some vocals on there. And that was done. And he did a great job, you know. Yeah, we were all very th thankful and happy that he he did a great job on that, you know. But of course, when I was back, and a lot of people still asking the question, how much is left of the, of Don Dawkins' voice on Blackout? It's not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I did it all myself, and I'm so happy I I, I did. And but at the time, Don was a great help. And he's a great guy. Whenever we play California, mostly he shows up, you know. And so Rudolf uh, would have said to me, come on, Klaus, we wait for you. It would have been easy maybe to hire Don Dokken for the band and to have an American uh, lead singer. Ah, I mean, when you think about it, but I mean, Don had a great career without the Scorpions, I think. And with Black after Blackout, I mean the career of the Scorpions were like you know. Right. It was like a rock, you know. And it's a great album to this day. And we still have many songs in the set list when we play uh live. Right now we hope we come back to the United States next next year. And let's see, but I can't give away too much right now. It's not over yet. <laughs> So, uh, Klaus, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Scorpions were one of the first bands to play in the USSR in 89. So uh, what was that experience like? What do you remember from that? This has a very special place in our hearts because we're Germans, you know, because of history, because the generation of our parents went to war with the whole world, but also especially with Russia. And uh, for us to play there, also because we never were allowed to play east of the Berlin Wall, we never had a chance to go there and, and play shows in, in East Germany. You know, so through a Hungarian promoter, we had very good connections to Moscow, and we had the offer to play five shows in Moscow and five in Leningrad in, in 88. And... Uh, we were not the first band. The, the first band was British band Uriah Heep, who played a few shows in Russia, I think. Uh, but before we left for Moscow, they cancelled our Moscow shows, you know, and they offered us uh, instead five shows in Moscow. You guys go and play 10 shows in Leningrad. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, we were disappointed because we wanted to also play in Moscow, but time was not right. And we agreed to go to Leningrad, today St. Petersburg, and we played 10 shows there. And we told the, the media, uh, there were hundreds of press people, like before the first concert, a big press conference. We said, our parents came with tanks, we come with guitars. Mm. No, and we bring love and peace. And it was an amazing experience. And with all the success we enjoyed in the free world up to then, this was like a whole new territory. It was like behind the Iron Curtain. It was to go to a place where rock music was not allowed, where young kids get busted you know because they listen to some western music you know uh, it was uh, a brave thing it was a huge operation to play those shows but the great thing was that the Russian audience they loved our music they knew our music because they have heard our songs before they were changing, exchanging uh, tapes, cassettes for the cassette players, you know, so they knew our music and those 10 shows were completely sold out with 15, 16,000 people every night. Wow. And it was the biggest sports arena in Leningrad at the time. 
it was just an amazing experience. And when one year later, the Moscow Music Peace Festival happened in Moscow, it was because in the Kremlin was a new guy, Mikhail Gorbachev. He made it happen. And also, I think the fact that we have played 10 shows in Leningrad in 88 was a door opener for everybody to follow and to play in Moscow, whether it's Motley Crue, Bon Jovi, or Ozzy Osbourne. They all were part of the Moscow Music Peace Festival, and Doc McGee put it all together, and he didn't forget the Scorps <laughs> who, who played there first and made it happen. And it was an amazing moment to play in Leyland Stadium for two nights in front of over 200,000 people. And uh, they came from Siberia, from everywhere, from all over the East Bloc countries, also from our neighbors in the, from the DDR, East Germans, came to Moscow to, to see us for the very first time. A historical moment. It was like looking back, something like a Russian Woodstock, you know? Yeah. And the vibe was <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, they lit the Olympic fire, you know, for rock and roll, you know? And it was like, I can't believe this is really And to see the Russian soldiers when we start stage with blackout, uh, see the Russian soldiers turning around. They were like security uh, in, the, in the stadium. And there were lots and lots and lots of them. But they became fans. They threw their caps in the air, take their jackets out, you know, and they became one, one with the fans. Western culture, you know, it was quite a very, very special and exciting moment, and it was very inspiring. When I come home, when I came home, I wrote "Wind of Change," mm. which was, yeah, probably an unexpected song uh, because it was so very much connected with what we experienced in the Soviet Union. We saw like time of the Cold War would be over soon, you know. This was when we came home. There was this was a feeling. We, we saw a whole new generation, and those Russian kids said, "The Cold War is over," you know. And it was I was filled with hope, hoping mm. for coming together, for getting the past, you know, where it was the West is a good guy, the East is a bad guy. No, we all joined together, uh, and music was. The language who made it happen, you know, rock and roll, rock music had the power to bring all those people together. So it was a very positive outlook into the future that the next generations to come uh, will live, live in a world together, you know, to make it better. Now we know it didn't work out that way. Uh, which is a sad, sad story. And but, since the invasion of Russia in the Ukraine uh, in February last year, you see that f you can take freedom for granted, you know, important for, for all of us, for our life and for generations to come. And of course, we hope there will be peace again and this terrible and senseless war will be over soon. And you kind of just answered my next question, Klaus, because uh, you've composed your fair share of songs. Uh, so I was going to ask you about the earliest inspiration for Winds of Change, and it was that those shows in uh, Russia. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, one day it was organized. We jumped on a boat on the Moskwa, on the river, the Moskwa, uh, and the destination was Gorky Park, uh, and it was all the musicians, all the media people uh, from all over the world, and Russian soldiers, Russian bands, British bands, U.S. bands, German bands, all together speaking one language, music, you know, and it was such a, like a vision, we're all together here in Moscow, and 
seems that music is so powerful, you know, such a powerful language, and that it it might change the world, you know, and and it was a very touching moment. And the reason we came up with a song like "Wind of Change" is because we grew up uh, after World War II in a divided Germany, in a divided city of Berlin with the Berlin Wall. Uh, for us, the meaning to play behind the Iron Curtain and it's, it was so much stronger, so emotional. For I guess for Bon Jovi, Ozzy, Motley, for them it was let's hey hey dudes let's rock the Iron Curtain you know and let's rock the Soviet Union. Yeah, it was cool, but for us it was much much more you know it had, it had a much deeper, stronger meaning, and that's why. I guess uh, I, I wrote that song because it came straight off out of my system, mm. out of my soul, uh, because I just wanted to write down the whole experience, what we saw and what we were part of, you know, we were part of it. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the song before the Berlin Wall came down, you know, but it was all up in the air. You could feel it in Moscow that things are about to change. You know, this change will come. That's what I tried to say. This was for so many people in East and West. Even after so many years, this song uh, has a special place for a lot of people. And it's so much connected with the end of the Cold War, the coming down of the Berlin Wall. You wouldn't think when you write a song, <laughs> a song can can be in that place for decades and for for a long time to come probably, you know, because we all want peace. We all want to live in a peaceful world, want to have freedom, you know, and that will never change, you know. And therefore, this song is still very relevant these days, especially these days. I changed the lyrics. Because when we played Las Vegas last year, I changed the lyrics because I thought it's not the time to romanticize Russia with lines like I follow the Moskva to Rocky Park, let your balalaika sing, you know. So I changed a few lines uh, to make clear that we support uh, the Ukraine, you know. Now the song, and this is, I sang it for the first time when the tour started last year in Vegas, uh, now listen to my heart, it says Ukraine waiting for the winter change. You know, mm. so, and we played last year and this year, last year in the US and this year in Latin America and Europe. Uh, so they all understand the message. And so that's why I said, after all these years, you wouldn't think the song is still so, so relevant and popular, you know, but for people, uh, it it's even after all these years it means a lot so klaus out of all the songs that you've composed or all the all the live shows that you've done what would you say is the most challenging song to perform the most challenging song to perform it's between still loving you and no one like you mm, is that just the vocal range of it yeah the vocal range of it i i would say on top of the list would be no one like you <laughs> because it, it's a tough one. You know, the chorus doesn't give you a break to take a breather. You know, it's all the time up there and it's a tough one to perform, you know, but at the same time, uh, it's one of our biggest hits in the United States. And it's great to see that our fans still like it so much whenever we, we play in the U S you know, this is one of the big ones in America. While still loving you is much more popular, being such a strong ballad uh, here in Europe, especially you know. But it's also for a singer a tough one to perform. What would seventy-five-year-old Klaus say to nineteen-year-old Klaus? <laughs> I would say, keep going, keep going, mate. <laughs> this is something I like to ask everyone to. Uh... 
Have you ever had an experience that you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Not something that comes to my mind right away, you know. Maybe I had supernatural, supernatural kind of experience. That's what you're saying? Yeah, or spiritual. Spiritual, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel my heart. I feel I'm close to God. You know, I believe in God, you know, and uh, there might be spiritual moments along the way. You know, of course, there, there probably there are. You know, I, I always can feel it when we're some places on the road and I might see a little beautiful church along the way and I go there and the whole vibe and atmosphere, this is where I feel very much connected, you know. But with or without a church, I, I feel connected with God anyway, mm -hmm. anywhere, anytime. Klaus, just to put a bow on everything here, just tell folks what's on the horizon for you. What can we expect coming up? Well, we're still out there with the Rock Believer Tour. Takes us around the world. And there, even though we have a little break right now, uh, we keep going next year. We pick it up. And like I said, we might come back to the United States. There are a lot of other places we haven't been on this tour so far. And we keep going. And who knows if we go back to the studio at some point again. Uh, we never really talk about it. Right now, we're still doing Rock Believer Tour. And we enjoy it a lot, you know. There's so many Rock Believers out there. When you think so many people... And all those years said rock is dead because of grunge, because of hip hop, because of rap, whatever it is, you know. But no, it's not that at all. You know, there's so many, there are millions of rock believers out there. And uh, we can't wait to see them in 2024 and in 25, because it will mark the 60th anniversary of the Scorpions. Wow. <laughs> That is something quite special, you know. And uh, so right now, 24, 25, next year we're on the road and we put it all together right now. And we can f can't wait to see the Rock Believers out there again. The new album is still a new album, Rock Believer, you know. And uh, we can't wait to go out there and maybe we change a couple of songs in the show uh, we'll see, we'll see, you know, it's too early to say, uh, and, uh, but we can wait to, to be out there next year. And, uh, for 25, yeah, it's 60 years. Hard to believe, you know, there are guys, the next generation ahead of us, like the Rolling Stones, you know, it's amazing to see what they're doing. Just heard a couple of days ago, the, uh, their new songs, and man, they're rocking hard, you know, that's pretty cool. Thank you so much, Klaus. That was amazing. <laughs> All right. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm going to let you get out of here and you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Justin, keep going what you're doing and best of luck. Hope to see you out there when we might play in South Carolina again. <laughs>